And if you'd like to turn to Isaiah chapter 53 as we begin this study, um, it's another amazing messianic um, passage. It means it's full of Christ. Here is the prophet talking of the Lord Jesus Christ and talking about how nobody really believed or understood what was going on when he was here on earth. It was written 700 years before he came, but it's like the prophet is, is able to look back on him and sort of say, well, this is what was true of him, even though uh, he still had 700 years before his birth. Once again, full of staggering truth. Uh, let's hear the whole chapter, Isaiah 53, and we're going to focus, as I said, on the third verse. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. May God bless that reading from his word. It doesn't matter how many times I read that passage. There's always something new and something very deep in it about 
our Lord Jesus Christ and all of his suffering. Now, I wanted to deal with this this morning for many reasons, um, but one of them is, uh, given the age that we live in, which is such a fun-loving age, uh, we've started to try and regard the Lord Jesus Christ um, as appropriate for a fun-loving age. Jesus is our pal. He's our buddy. He's just like us. Um, how many times have you been in a conversation or heard a conversation where people are saying, you know, Jesus had a sense of humor. If you look on, uh, on the internet and you search for Jesus and fun, uh, you will find all attempts to represent Jesus as a fun lover, as a fun seeker, as one whose primary concern for you and me is that we should have fun. Well, how does that square up with what Isaiah prophesies about him here? How can he be called in this third verse of Isaiah 53, a man of sorrows and acquainted with with grief. If you look into those words, it may be more appropriate, it's certainly not less appropriate, to translate them as pains and sicknesses. A man of pains and acquainted with sickness. And the words don't just mean physical pain, physical sorrow, physical uh, anguish. It talks about mental pain. It talks about mental anguish and sorrow. And perhaps when, when we see those words, we, we, we tend to sort of join the dots and we say, aha, yes, the cross. There he knew pain. There he knew anguish. Um, and certainly there is no, there's no doubt. You know, we, we could never comprehend all that he went through upon the cross. But what I want us to see this morning is that that was the summit of his suffering. For him, grief and sorrow, pain and sickness were a daily thing. Moment by moment, he was tormented with these things. And it's critical to understand that. You won't be saved by a fun-loving Jesus. Let me tell you that, because he does not exist in the pages of Scripture. He's fiction. Only the man of sorrows can save you. We're going to see why that is. It's critical that we don't get deceived by this nonsense that's out there. This... Uh, kind of anti-sanctification. You know how we're supposed to be made as Christians more like Jesus? Well, what are we doing? We're making him more like us because that way the gap's not so big and hey, we don't look so bad. We're not having that Jesus here today. We don't want that Jesus. We want the Jesus of Scripture, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. All I want to do this morning is just to survey his life and see why. Why this title for Jesus? Why does it fit him? Why is he a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief? And we'll, we'll look through many passages of Scripture. I won't read them all, uh, but you'll know many of these accounts. I just want to remind you of them, and, and by bringing it all together try and impress upon all of us here this morning how much he endured for us if we are his children. And then I want to apply it to us and see, well, so what? What does that mean to me today? How should I live um, in the light of these things? So here are 
some of the reasons, and it's not all of them, I don't think we could ever understand them all, some of the reasons why he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. First of all, he dwelt among sinners. Uh, you and I dwell among sinners every day, but as sinners ourselves, that doesn't seem such a, 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 a struggle for us. But if you are sinless and you are placed into this world, let me tell you, um, that is torment, as we will see. One of the causes of torment for Jesus was the pride and hypocrisy of the leaders and the teachers of the nation of Israel, the covenant people of God. Woe to you, says Jesus. Woe to you. You travel around on sea and land to make one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Here are the people appoint in these positions of authority over the nation of Israel, and they're leading people to hell. Do you think that did not cause grief and sorrow to the Son of God? And they were doing it full of pomp and ceremony. They looked wonderful on the outside, like whitewashed tombs. But inside, said Jesus, they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Now, put yourself to the extent you are able. Imagine sinlessness. And imagine seeing the leaders of, of the people who who are in covenant with you, taking them down a path by example that will lead them to hell. The sensual conduct of the people was another thing. The scripture says in 2 Peter 2 that Lot, who, who made his home in, in Sodom, as you remember, had a righteous soul, he was a righteous man, and he was tormented by what he saw and heard as he lived in that city. And he was a sinner. Now imagine the spotless Son of God come into this world, and every day he's dealing and ministering to the people he came to save, their prostitutes, their swindlers, their people who are full of corruption, their proud and arrogant leaders. What do you think the torment was like for him? who knew no sin. Then think of unbelief. The unbelief of the people. Remember how he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration uh, and, and he comes to this house and there's the father and the son who's got a demon and, and the other disciples can't, can't drive the demon out. And they can't understand why. And the man says to Jesus, well, I, I brought my son to your disciples and they couldn't uh, do the job. Uh, and listen, not just to the words, listen to the heart here from Jesus. You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Is there torment there? This, this mixture, if we might put it this way, of, of righteous anger and sorrow can't you feel it in his words? Three years he ministered. He did miracles in Capernaum, in uh, Chorazin, and, and many other towns around the Sea of Galilee. Three years. And they would not believe him. They would not believe him. But if we continue in this progression, it wasn't just the, the people in general who did not believe him. His disciples didn't believe him. There are so many examples of this. You remember when they, they started on a journey and the disciples said, oh no, we didn't bring any bread. This is a problem. What are we going to do? And Jesus said, where's your faith? Where's your faith? How many scraps did you pick up when I fed the 5,000? What about the 4,000? What are you talking about having no bread for? Or they're out on the sea. And the storm is threatening to break over the boat. And in Mark's account, I think they even say to Jesus, they wake him up because he's sleeping. 
don't you care that we're perishing? And he says, you men of little faith, why are you afraid? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do? Where's your faith? Or Peter, we, we, we studied this recently in a morning sermon. Peter, who hears about how he's going to be betrayed and, and, and crucified. And, and Peter says, this isn't going to happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Or think about how uh, those same disciples who'd been unable to drive out the boy from that, uh, uh, the demon from that boy, when Jesus came down from uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, they came to Jesus and they said, why couldn't we do it? And he says, because of the little less, littleness of your faith. Think of James and John when they're going through a Samaritan village and, and they're on their way to Jerusalem and, and the Samaritans want nothing to do with them. And James and John say, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume them? And Jesus rebuked them and said, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. You are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Then imagine Jesus, the spotless Son of God, sitting in and listening to this conversation with his disciples, the twelve, I presume, about which of them was greatest. You know, I can't read that without thinking of Cassius Clay as he then was. I am the greatest. You, know, you can almost see the disciples say, well, it's got to be me, hasn't it? I mean, just look, look at my credentials. Look how special I am to Jesus. It's got to be me. Can you imagine how that would torment the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ? These are just a few examples. The unbelief, the staggering misunderstanding and slowness of heart on the part of his disciples. And what about the abuse of his father's house? Remember how they turned it into a den of robbers. They were trading selling animals, making profit right in the courts of the temple. And Jesus makes a whip. And he comes in and he turns over the tables and scatters the coins everywhere. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Was he full of anguish and sorrow then? So these were the people amongst whom he came. And I believe that every moment brought new torment to this spotless Son of God. But then we go one step further. It's not just their behavior. It is that to a man they rejected him. The Jews turned their backs on their promised Messiah. I imagine Jesus may have known that was going to happen, but don't think there was no pain or grief associated with that rejection. The people of God promised the Messiah for so long. And now he comes. And they want nothing to do with him. He came <coughs> to his own, says John. And those who were his own did not receive him. Remember how the crowds deserted him? He'd spoken something that seemed very difficult and perplexing to them. You've got to eat my body and drink my blood or you'll have no life in you. They didn't understand what he was saying to them. And they said, well, this is, this is difficult. Who can accept this? And they turned their backs. And in large numbers, the crowds left him. Something of a turning point in his earthly ministry, and he turns to the twelve. And maybe it's just me, but it seems there's real pathos here. He turns to the twelve and he says, you do not want to go away also, do you? I've got the words of life. And my people 
don't want to hear it. His hometown, remember how Nazareth dealt with him? They wanted to kill him. They took him to the brow of a hill. They were going to throw him out. His own family. John 7, his brothers giving him all kinds of advice. I think it was tongue-in-cheek advice about being more public. No one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. Think about the betrayal of Judas. Of course he knew it was going to happen. Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Because he knew in advance, was that then just a matter of indifference to him? Oh, well, it's happened, I knew that. Let's move on. Well, if you read Psalm 41, which is another messianic psalm, this is a comment which I believe is from the Lord Jesus Christ in that psalm. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. He trusted Judas. He trusted him with the money bag. He trusted him with ministry. Judas went out preaching the gospel. He was one of the twelve. Do you think there was no pain when Judas betrayed him? And then when it comes closer to the cross, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He knew that was going to happen too. And sure enough, he was arrested. And what did the disciples do? Even the twelve. You don't want to leave me too, do you? Oh, no. I'll never leave you. I'll never deny you. If I have to die, I won't deny you. Where were they? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Peter follows on and Peter denies him. In the hearing of Jesus, in, in Luke's account, he says, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And the rooster crows and Jesus turns and looks at Peter. And then Peter remembers. And then last of all, as we read in Psalm 22, his own father forsakes him on the cross. Now try and understand this. It was your sin that separated him from his father. Nothing else could possibly have done it. But was anyone ever so alone as this? It's no wonder it says in Psalm 22, there is none to help. There's no one. No friends, no family, no crowds, no teachers, no disciples, no father. He's alone on the cross. If you want more evidence that he is indeed a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, do you remember that passage we read in Hebrews earlier on? where it says, in the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. Remember how he looked over Jerusalem, and, and you can do this, if you, if you come to Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives, you get this amazing panorama of the city of Jerusalem. And he would come that way from Bethany. And on one occasion, he comes and suddenly that view opens up before him and he breaks down in tears. He saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace. And on another occasion, he says, 
I have held out my arms. I wanted to gather you under my wings as a hen gathers her brood. And you would not have it. Can you sense the pain there? What about the death of Lazarus? When Jesus saw Mary, Martha, weeping, and the Jews who came over with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Jesus wept. These are not crocodile tears. His heart was full of sorrow. If you look into the, the words that are used here, the, the turmoil that was going on inside, it's that righteous anger again that sin has brought this into the world. This that a close friend has succumbed to death the wages of sin. Think of his anguish in the garden when he sweat great drops of blood and he says to his disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And later on, being in agony, he was praying very fervently. Don't minimize what happened to him in the garden. But there is more. What about his temptation? Was anyone ever tempted like the Lord Jesus Christ? You haven't resisted, says the writer to the Hebrews, to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. He did. He never sinned. He knew an intensity of temptation and struggle that you and I could never know because we give in far too soon. He never gave in. And the battle raged within him. It wasn't just when Satan took him into the wilderness. Don't think that's the only temptation he knew. Just review what we've been going through already this morning. Virtually every aspect of his grief and his sorrow was an opportunity for Satan to tempt him. Ha, even your family doesn't care about you now. Is it worth it? You don't want to go through with this, do you? It's costing too much. Give it up. Why not? They're not worth it. Can you imagine how intense that struggle was? And then the pinnacle of it all on the cross. How can we ever enter into all that took place there in the relationship between the Son and the Father, the darkness that came over the land, the sin that was charged to his account. That's why he was sweating drops of blood in the garden because he knew and he was close to being overwhelmed at the prospect of having the sins of his people charged to him and receiving his father's righteous anger for them. And it broke his heart. That's what it says in Psalm 69, verse 20. Reproach has broken my heart and I am so sick and I looked for sympathy but there was none and for comforters but I found none they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink that's why he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Is there ever a sorrow like his? That's what it says in Lamentations. Look, you who pass by. Is there ever sorrow like my sorrow? Torment, rejection, grief, temptation, and pain, physical and mental of a kind that you and I will never know 
because of his sinlessness, he experienced all of these things to a far greater degree than we possibly can. People looked at him and said, you're not yet 50 years old. No, he wasn't. He was just over 30. But he looked closer to 50. It's amazing that his human frame bore it for the length of time that he did. Well, we need to apply this to ourselves, particularly as, as we're shortly to come to the Lord's table. I want to see what we can learn about our Savior from this and then what we can learn for ourselves. And uh, what can we learn about Jesus? Well, what about the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of his love? That he would come down and endure all of this, all of this suffering. Yes, the pinnacle of it in the cross, but this, this sums it all up. It was a life of sorrow and anguish and grief. Think of, of this enormous range of things that he endured. That's the breadth of his love for you. If you're his uh, child today, if you're saved through him today. Think of the height, the stoop from the bliss of heaven into this pit, this sinful world. That is the height of his love. Or the depth descending into hell, enduring your hell so that he could lift you up out of it. That's the depth of his love. Think of the length he went to so that he could save you. That's the first thing, the staggering love of Jesus. But also, as I've already said earlier today, he is perfectly fitted because of this to be your savior. Somebody might say, well, was it really necessary? Did he really have to go through all of this? Absolutely. Because we needed, we had to have a sympathetic high priest. We had to have one who had learned about sin by being here in the middle of it. And experiencing the situation of those who were held captive to it. So that he could plead our case before God in heaven. He had to learn about the torment of sin by being among sinners. He had to learn about loneliness by being the most lonely person that ever lived. He had to learn about the power of temptation. He had to learn grief and sorrow. He had to resist sin to the point of shedding his blood. He had to go further and deeper into all of our experiences than we could ever go so that he can stand before God in our behalf. He had to learn obedience to the will of God in all these things. So there is nothing, nothing that you can go through as a child of God where you'll be able to say to Jesus, you don't understand. You know, young people, you love to say that to your parents. You don't understand. Or maybe they don't. But don't tell me Jesus doesn't understand. He went through all of this so that he would understand. Can you imagine a more perfect Savior than this? Now, what about us? We need to look at this Jesus, not this fun-loving Jesus. If you read the, uh, the little passage from Matthew Henry on the bulletin, he's never recorded as having laughed in Scripture. But he's recorded very much as having wept and grieved. And is it any surprise? Well, how do we match up to this Jesus? Because he's our example in these things. Um, are we tormented by sin in this world 
the way that even righteous Lot was. You know, we, we love to criticize Lot. He made a bad decision. He went and he lived in the midst of it in Sodom. And I don't know why he stayed there. But he was tormented by it. We're living in a kind of Sodom today. Are we tormented? Tormented? We don't like it. But are we tormented? Well, what about Christ as our example? Are we grieved over the unbelief in this land? Over the unbelief in the church? Over the unbelief of those who name the name of Christ? Over the false teachers who are leading people to hell? Who think they're safe? Does that cause us grief? Our own lack of faith, our own denials of the Lord Jesus Christ, our own betrayals of him. Because we sit around his table and we share in the meal. And then there are those are occasions where, where we betray him too. And we go off and do what we want to do. Does the world desert us because of Jesus? It deserted him. Or does the Holy Spirit desert us because of our sin? How often do we weep over the effects of sin in the creation of God? How often do we give ourselves to prayer and fasting? How far are we resisting temptation in our lives to the point of shedding blood? Shouldn't we be, to some extent, never to the same extent, but to some extent, men and women of sorrow and acquainted with grief? If we're being made like Jesus, yes, there, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory in the Christian life. Thank God. There's victory. There's praise. There's a marvelous Savior. I don't want to minimize those things at all. But there is sin in this world. There is sin in our hearts, in my heart. Shouldn't I grieve over that? Shouldn't I mourn over that? So that's the first thing. How do we match up to Jesus as an example? Now, the second is this. We've got to be careful how we live. Because we are capable of doing things in our lives that when Jesus was here on earth caused him grief and sorrow. Engaging in sinful conduct. That did, didn't it? Being slow of heart to believe. Abusing the dwelling of God, which now is us, the church. Forsaking and denying Christ. We can do those things now. We know that when he was here on earth, those things made up a contribution of his grief and his sorrow. We know these things can grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't fully understand these things because the Holy Spirit is spirit and, and it, it's taking what's true of, of men and, and using it to, to try and help us to understand. There is injury to his holiness. There is a wounding <coughs> of his love. We've got to put off all the things that we know caused Jesus sorrow and grief when he was here on earth. And if you are not a believer, hopefully what we looked at in the life of Jesus has shown you how monstrous and how toxic sin really is. You can't minimize it. People caused him sorrow then by turning their backs on him. If you're not a believer, you're turning your back on him even now. Even now, you're probably finding a way to harden your heart against this message. 
I won't have this Jesus. I don't want him. He's not for me. I will not bow the knee to him. I won't have him as my king. I want to live my own life. People caused him sorrow then by refusing to listen to him just as you often do now. He's talking to you now. How often would I have taken you under my wings as a hen gathers her brood? And you were not willing. You would not come. People betrayed him then and caused him pain and sorrow just as you can do now. All those people, if they never repented, are suffering for that today, right now. And there is no end in sight for that, just an increase in intensity. When they receive their bodies and can suffer physically as well as spiritually. And they are cast into a lake of fire. And it need not be so because he's the perfect savior for you. He understands. Look at all that he went through so that he could offer himself to you. And you could be sure that he could save you to the uttermost. Why won't you come to him? What reason do you possibly have to turn down this man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, the perfect high priest, the glorious Savior? Let's pray together in quietness for a few moments.